Hi, I'm Carol Ann Riddell, and welcome to a very special edition of Book It with CA. We recently spoke with legendary choreographer Bob Avian about his memoir, Dancing Man, co-authored with writer Tom Santopietro. It was a lively and fun conversation full of behind-the-curtain Broadway anecdotes. Bob was funny, warm, and generous with his time. We were all devastated to hear of his passing just days later. Today, we bring you that interview as a tribute to his huge talent and the indelible mark he left on Broadway. Bob and Tom, what a treat to see you. I'm so glad to be speaking with you today. It is great to see you again, Carol Ann. So uh, your book is Dancing Man and Bob, it chronicles your incredible journey as a Broadway choreographer. Uh, and there's so much to talk about there. But before we do, I just want to ask, because um, I'm curious, you co-authored this book. How did it come about? Well, Tom is an old friend of mine. We've worked in the theater for quite a few years, never together, but off the stage, we've been good pals. And watching Tom's career climb this wonderful literature ladder has been thrilling for me. So Tom, did you push it? Uh, Carol Ann, I, yes, I would say my part of that equation, you just saw how nice Bob is. Bob is so modest after this unbelievable career that I had to badger him. I think Bob was so tired of listening to me. And I said, Bob, you are walking Broadway history. Nobody's had a career like this. So I, I insisted and Bob acquiesced and we had such a great time doing the book. It, this was really a pleasure for me because I wanted everybody to see how talented Bob is. Yeah, well, I, I think that comes across in the book. So you describe the book as a memoir in three acts. So I'd love to start at the beginning. Uh, Bob, you say, as a young man, you really had no formal dance training. And beyond yeah. that, being a dancer was not what your parents had imagined as a career for you. That's for sure. You know, I was brought up as a uh, Armenian, Protestant child, lots of religion. And you kept getting jobs in summer stock, right? So they kept saying, well, okay, you're getting work. Yeah, and I didn't know if I would, but I did. And uh, my parents said one summer, where are you going this summer? Pittsburgh, what? <laughs> like something? I said, yeah, I'm dancing. And they said, when did that happen? Who was the <laughs> dancing person? And uh, Whatever. But I was blessed and they were blessed with me. And uh, they were very proud of me ultimately. And yeah. in the beginning too. A lot of things changed for you with West Side Story when you got a role dancing in, in that show. Yes, it made me braver. I'd say that number one. And all I knew is when you're in a Broadway show is everybody else in the dressing room is out auditioning for other Broadway shows. So that's how you pass your time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. Tom, do you have a favorite anecdote from those early years of Bob as a dancer? Well, I do. I think, Carol Ann, one, one of the things that interested me is, uh, as we've been saying, you know, Bob is dancing in West Side Story for Jerome Robbins. He's meeting Michael Bennett. And then, as always happens in show business, it, it's a business of ups and downs. And then when we were doing the book, Bob said to me, well, then I had four flops in a row as a dancer. And I, I was so startled. And then that all changed. What I loved is how that changed when Bob went into Funny Girl and is on stage with Barbara Streisand eight times a week. Wow. So it's the cyclical nature of showbiz. And I, I just love, I, I would always ask Bob, what was it like being right there with the young Barbara Streisand? What was it like, Bob? <laughs> it, was, it was inspiring. She was so young, you know, I kept on thinking she's younger than me. You know, she was, uh, at the time, 24. I guess I was around the same age in there, but she was a star with all her might. Yes. Something to revel in. And had a real work ethic, I think I remember reading in the book, right? Oh, she never missed. The, the one year I was in the show, she missed one performance. Wow. Didn't take vacations, whatever. She had a way of getting through the show if she was tired 
because it was the period when she was recording other albums, doing TV specials, and she still didn't miss the show. So it wasn't too long uh, from that point on when you shifted from being a dancer to being a choreographer. How does that transition happen? Well, because of Michael Bennett and West Side Story. He's the one who wanted to be the choreographer. Uh, I, I just was, I always went down that road where let's see where this leads me. And he was ambitious. And that was his gift, being a choreographer. And he knew that. I didn't know where my gift was specific. And so because we became drinking brothers and buddies and best pals, he just took me along. And not only just took me along, we were very supportive of each other and had very tremendous bonding. And I saw the first thing he'd do with choreographing some stock which was a production of No Strings mm -hmm. that he did from scratch. It was stunning. And I went, holy moly, this guy has got it. Right. And I encouraged that and, uh, and, and fostered that in him. He was five years my junior and uh, I could do that for him. talk about some of the big shows that you worked on uh, with Michael Bennett and of course you know of course the smash hit A Chorus Line and it was your first Tony Award Bob what a moment that must have been I read in the book how proud your parents were what was that like unbelievable I had been shot to the moon and uh, it was pretty amazing yeah it's everything you think it's going to be and yeah, more. yeah imagine it had to be um but you know with that kind of success comes a lot of stress and things that you have to manage. And Tom, I thought of you when you talked about that in the book, because you've interviewed many people over the years who've had sort of like very instant and, and immense success. And that sometimes has unintended consequences, things that we don't expect. What did you make of that? Oh, I, th I think that's a, a question is right on point. And I think, you know, one thing Bob and I talked about a lot is He's the co-choreographer of the biggest hit in town and actually around the world. Mm -hmm. And it's both fantastic and certainly brings financial freedom, but it brings a different set of problems. And I think one of the big things, and everybody in show business uh, has to face this, how do you follow up on a huge right. hit like that? That's what right. steps are that you can still grow as an artist? And I, I think, you know, Bob and Michael figured that out because the next show didn't work, Ballroom, although Bob won a second Tony Award, but then came Dream Girls, a whole nother dazzling new step for musical theater. And that's what real artists like Bob do. They figure it out and keep growing. Yeah. And one, forgive me, Tom, but one aspect of a show like The Chorus Line is when we brought it to Joe Papp down at the public theater, it was our show. It didn't belong to another producer. It was our package and we were producing it. And so we brought the works with us. And which meant once that show opened, we had to maintain it as well and protect company after company and be in there as a producing element year after year. Who knew, who thought the, the work that was in title and how many people we would hire after all those years. It was pretty amazing. And a chorus line was really a game changer. I mean, it, there wasn't anything like it. It was sort of unprecedented in terms of what a hit it was yes. at that time. And it was one of the longest running shows for a long time as well, is that right? Correct, yeah, yeah. We, we broke the bag, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, Carol Ann, one of the things I loved uh, listening to Bob's stories was just that when, even when it was still downtown and it had become the this sensation everybody was talking about, it was already so sought after that a very pregnant Diana Ross was sitting on the stairs to watch the show. Wow. I mean, that's the kind of event Bob and Michael had created. and. Of course, for anybody interested in Broadway theater, that those sorts of stories are uh, 
kind of catnip for, <laughs> for listening. I'd say. Bob, let's talk a little bit more about your partnership with Michael. How would you describe that relationship that lasted so many years? Uh, brotherly, family. Uh, we were just, luckily we, we met and became good pals when we were still very young, especially mm -hmm. Michael. He was 18 years old. So he, what he gave to me was his total trust. trust. And I return that. And I always stood up for him and for him. And plus I knew he had this amazing gift that I always wanted to nourish and protect. And I knew he knew intuitively much more than I knew. And of course he was blessed with that. How many years did you work together, Bob? Well, until his death. So from the time he was 18 years old, until his death, when he was about 44, 45 years old. The point in the book when Michael becomes ill is really heart-wrenching. What struck me about it also, what was uniquely painful in some ways, Bob, was that you were sort of you know, going through this awful thing personally, but professionally, you were also branching out as a solo choreographer. So yes. what was that like? It was, overall, it was a tragic period. We had a few shows out there, as well as dance and buddies. And this strange disease was becoming vibrant and mean in the world. Yeah. And what is this? What is this? And we'd see the youngest people get stricken down and die. We had never been through that before. And of course, here we are again, right? with COVID, but yeah. it, uh, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. And all of a sudden we knew more people and more people and more people who had gotten this disease. And finally it struck the inside. And finally Michael got it. And I, I stayed with him while we went from hospital to hospital to hospital. Uh, Michael said to me, surely maybe I'm, famous enough now and have the money enough now that I can find the doctor with the cure who can help me. And I said, we should be able to do that. Honey. And there we were flying off to Minneapolis and Houston and trying to find answers. And they all said the same thing. We're not going to make it. Can we just knew so little about AIDS at that time. Yes. And, uh, We'd be staying in these cities in a hotel room and, and, and Michael would just do tests all day long with bleak, bleak reasons. Tom, was this a difficult part of the book to write? It was a difficult part because Bob and Michael were, the relationship was just so close. You know, as Bob said, they were brothers. They were best friends and coworkers. And so, uh, you know, it was tough, of course, for Bob to relive it, but, uh, you know, we had made an agreement that everything in the book, of course, had to be completely honest. And I think what's so interesting is that after the tragedy of losing Michael, that's when Bob choreographed on his own for the first time. So that gave the story uh, Bob's life story, a forward momentum and pushed it forward. And really that's what came up with when I talked to Bob about how we wanted to do the book and that it couldn't just be, and then I did this show and then I did that show. Right. And Bob said, when we were talking about losing Michael and going off on his own, Bob said to me, you know, the theme is I'm a late bloomer. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting because we, we all want to know we can have a second act. Sure. And that's sure. what Bob did. One of the wonderful things that happened at that point in your life, though, Bob, was that it was right around the same time that you met Peter, your husband, right? Yes. Uh, it was 1979. Mm -hmm. I just opened a show on Broadway called Ballroom that Michael and I produced. Unfortunately, it wasn't a hit. We did win the choreographic Tony Award, though. And, uh, but it was about older dancers who find life by going to Roseland, for instance. 
and find mature uh, relationships. It was a great time for me because meeting Peter was uh, opening up that new door yeah. that would take me to where I am today, 30 years later. And, Congratulations uh, on that. Yeah, that good. I mean, it, he must have also been a very grounding force for you during ultimately what became a really difficult time in terms of Michael's death. Yes, he was, even though he was much younger than me, mm -hmm. but he's very smart. He's the smartest guy I know. But as he always says, in this sense of, with a sense of humor, or not, I'm not so sure. You know, I was so thrilled to meet you because all I really wanted was an audition for a chorus, <laughs> which you got. Um, let's talk about some of the other shows. You've worked on so many huge shows, Miss Saigon, Sunset Boulevard. Bob, do you have a favorite or is that like asking a parent if they have a favorite child? No, I don't really have a favorite. I have moments in favorites and uh, or histories of uh, moments, I'd say. I just look on it all now and I, I think, wow, lucky, lucky, lucky. Wonderful. Tom, was there a, a behind the scenes story about those shows, um, some of those other big shows that you really love? Bob has such a great sense of humor. I. I have to say, I was just loving hearing about how Bob and Michael had to try to teach Katherine Hepburn to sing and dance when she didn't have a musical bone in her body. <laughs> and, and you know, so you have this great actress who can't move on the stage. And that's a sign of such talent that Bob and Michael figured out how to work around the limitations. And then <clears throat> with Bob's great sense of humor, he talked about the fact of, so she couldn't sing and dance. The show was a sellout because everybody wanted to see her. And Bob's term was, he said to me, you know what, Tom? We called the show our smash flop. And that <laughs> really made me laugh. That must have been a really exciting time, Bob, to, to be working with her. Oh, yeah. It was exciting and deadly. I mean, <laughs> we were going, oh, my God, we we're going to go to rehearsal to, today to start with the great Catherine Hepburn. Unfortunately, we got to rehearsal and she couldn't do a thing. And uh, we went, what do we do now? What do we do now? But she sold it out, right? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. She had that thing still though, that mm -hmm. broke the box office. Yeah. It was this emotion that the audience wanted to see raw and pure in front yeah. of them. It's, it's interesting, the power of a star vehicle like that. Yes, amazing. A question I have for both of you, uh, when you look at Broadway now, and I'm talking pre-pandemic, what do you think has changed most dramatically? Gee, I don't know if the basic line has changed. If you're asking me, I'm not gonna say ticket prices, because that's not why I go. You know, it's still about a star and the power she can give or he can give. It's still about that kid in the chorus who stands out. It's about that song you heard for the first time. There are so many things that remain the same. Tom, do you feel yes. there's anything dramatic that has changed when you look at shows, for example, like Hamilton? Right. Well, one thing, it's actually something Bob talked about, which really made me uh, uh, look at theater in general in a different way. And Bob said, well, the biggest difference is microphones. Because when, you know, Bob was starting out, people didn't have those individual microphones. Ethel Merman was not wearing a microphone like wow. that. And Bob point, said to me that when they choreographed Chorus Line, they had they were always aware of where the foot mics were on the stage in terms of the choreography. And now you don't have to do that because everybody's wearing their own mic. So that's a huge change artistically and in terms of the whole product, I think. And it's Bob that pointed that out to me. But I listen, I worked the, the history before that too, before we went from foot mic to foot mic, mm -hmm. when it was like almost no mics. And, you know, the good old days. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you got you belted out over that orchestra. Pit. Right, right. It's amazing that we could do it. 
Broadway has been so devastated by this pandemic. What's it like for both of you to see these famous stages dark for so long? Horrifying, terrible, everywhere. We're only part of the world too. Everybody is going through their backstage nightmare right now. And uh, it's the same for everybody. We're all waiting in the wings. I think Carol Ann, you know, the, the toughest part, as Bob said, you know, we're one small part of what the world in general is dealing with. But what's so missing is the camaraderie of Broadway. That's the joy of working in the theater. And I've always said, you know, that area from, let's say, West 41st Street to West 53rd Street, where all the Broadway theaters are, it's like our version of a college campus. And you see everybody coming in and out of the theaters. And that yeah. feeling of when you walk in the stage door and you belong and you're all putting on a show in all the different departments, it's such a great feeling. And boy, I miss that a lot. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the actual writing of the book uh, since you co-authored it. I'm just curious. So did you sit in a room together? Did you swap chapters? How did it work? Hardly. I mean, but I, we, Tom would say, okay, Bob, let's sit down and write. Okay, Tom, I'm ready. And he would, you know, he would sit down and write. I'd be walking around, making lunch or doing whatever. And uh, he was the writer's writer. He let me just say the words. Didn't have to go back over and over. And uh, he did a brilliant job. And were you on the phone or? We Wait. did everywhere because we'd known each other now for so long. And what I loved about Tom was he caught my voice. It, everybody has said to me who's read the book, I thought you were sitting right there talking to me because he, he knows my voice and he knows my inflection. And he got it, he got it all. When he said he wanted to do this book, I was so moved by his friendship and his wanting to write with me, little old me. And uh, I said, sure, you want to give it a go? I'd rather have no one else than you. Right, I can understand that. You've when just seen why Bob is such a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, there you go. That's, uh, it, this was, of all the books I've written, and it's eight now, this was by far the most fun. I sort of couldn't wait. I, You know, every day when we were working, I would say, Bob, okay, today we're going to talk everything about Miss Saigon. Start talking. Yeah. And, and that was a lot of fun. Early on, Bob said to me, this works because we speak the same language. Yeah. We, we can speak that Broadway shorthand. And I, you know... I'm the co-author of the book, but I have remained, and this is really true, I've always been a fan of Bob's work. And writing the book, I became more of a fan. It, it's an extraordinary um, amount of really first-class, game-changing work that he's done. And I imagine as a co-author, particularly of someone else's life, Tom, you have to have a pretty special skill set, among other things, being a very good listener. Well, you, you do have to listen. And I, in terms of the process, if I heard Bob, you know, say something of particular note, I, I could just nudge him down that road a little bit. And, uh, and so that was, uh, you know, when Bob said at one point during the, the heyday of Chorus Line, and he was, they were starting to put out all the additional companies, the touring company and the London company. And he talked about rehearsing all of those companies at the same time. So picture a hundred dancers together. And that image just resonated with me. And I said, we have to talk about that. What was it like? And then that led Bob to talk about one day when they staged the finale with everybody, that famous finale with the gold hats that everybody knows. Yes. yes. That's the, so it was sort of a back and forth like that. And that's what made the book so much fun to do. I would just like to say I was blessed with this book. I guess I had it in me, but I had the right guy to put it down on the page. It, you know, hopefully people are reading the book who love theater and love musical theater and all these big shows. But Bob said something that I think is, when we were writing the book, uh, 
pertinent to people in all walks of life and which makes the book expands the book and bob said when a door opens walk through it don't be afraid of change see what's on the other side you'll grow as a person whether what you do works or not you will have been changed by it and i just thought that image of walking through whatever door opens is a really valuable one for all of us it is it's advice we could all use certainly and especially right now i think Yes, exactly. Right now in particular. Yeah. yeah. Bob, Tom, thank you so much for all this time. Boy, this was such a pleasure. Um, I'm so glad to have been able to speak with you. Thanks very much. It is always great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Carol. Right. Pleasure for me too. Bob Avian was 83 years old. Our hearts go out to his husband, family, and friends. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks so much for joining us.